hardest thing is to keep a secret to the people you love. If I wasn't misdiagnosed at first, me being a bitter point, maybe me they call an interpersonal disability or a person that it's not like a bad thing. Yeah. 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 Hello world, this is Unsung Warrior with your very own host Orina Brian. Our guest today is called Miss Nina, a poet and a fellow youth who has undergone so much and still uses her voice to encourage people. Let's listen in. See, I always wonder why it can't be an hour, a day or an ear per se because the silence I hear, it's so loud it makes my ears bleed whenever I see how the girl child has been sandwiched by this thing called gender. So a moment of silence. As we mourn the death of the girl's identity because for the price of our father's X chromosome, she has been forced to pay a debt to society all because she's viewed as weak. Muslims from Madari, three bullets, one to his leg, another to his stomach, and one to his chest. His only mistake was being homeless. And then there was Max. For bullets to his chest from the man in blue, his only mistake was hiding in plain view. Let's not forget about Mutura and Jiro, brothers, whose only mistake was trying to get home to their mother. Then there was Lazarus, one shot to his head. His only mistake was not wearing a mask, and those are just a few who got the privilege of the prime time news. So, remember their names. Because yesterday was them. Tomorrow. <laughs> See, I wonder. I wonder when did serve and protect become comply or die? When did poverty become a reason for eradication? And when did we lose the true meaning of education? Because we're taught to memorize days and events in history, but we never take the time to learn from it. Talk of Saba Saba and the other uprisings, bloodshed. Is that the only way we can solve things? <laughs> Hi. Hi, Orina. Hi. So tell us, who are you? Uh, as you said, my name is Miss Nina. I'm mm -hmm. um, a poet. Actually, Miss Nina is a brand. <laughs> yeah. So I'm a poet. I am an executive director of a poetic group. It's called Minefields. And uh, aside from that, I don't. What else should I say? Should I just be tell us everything? everything. <laughs> tell us everything. Your age. What no, you do. No, not ask a lady no, her no, age. Okay, no. do apologize. Thank you. <laughs> uh -huh. So um, uh, w this show is called Unsung Warriors. Yeah. And we get to interview people, talk to people who have undergone through a lot and still have the audacity to face life as it is. Mm -hmm. So tell us. Why are you our unsung warrior today? Wow. You can start from the beginning. <laughs> oh, from the beginning now. Okay, my story has to do more of um, the voice in me. Mm -hmm. And uh, since I'm a poet, my poetry, number one, it's my voice. It's how I speak what is inside. And uh, it goes way back. Since uh, growing up, uh, I grew up in a family whereby I felt I didn't have a say. Uh, whenever I would speak up, it was it always brought some issues or some consequences, I would say. And so I learned how to keep things inside. And uh, to a point, uh, you know, not speaking, it actually led me, led me down a path of suicidal thoughts, of which I, I did try suicide twice. Uh -huh. Um, but then again, that was uh, the first time was in primary school, and uh, the second time was in high school. What was happening in primary school at that time? Okay, at that time in primary school, uh, number one, there was so much uh, bullying. I was being bullied back in primary school. Uh -huh. And uh, secondly, my grandmother is an alcoholic, and uh, in the village, so she was known for her alcoholism. So the the kids will tease me. Like, you know, your grandmother is a queen of alcohol, and in Totoa, you know, Mlevi. Uh -huh. It was crazy. And uh, I said, so that affected my self-esteem really bad. Mm -hmm. I didn't believe in myself whatsoever. And uh, coming on to high school, the same problems, like not 
you know, not believing in myself. So, yeah, so the second time I just, okay, the first time I just took a bunch of pills around the house. Didn't work. <laughs> oh my God, it was just a bad stomach ache. Mm-hmm. And uh, the second time, I took a container of Puritan. We used to have a shop. Okay, my grandfather used to have a shop. Uh-huh. So I took a container of Puritan and I just took them, hoping to just sleep and not wake up. So um, basically, like not being able to speak, uh, feeling all this pain and no one is understanding me, I felt isolated. But thanks, thanks to God, now that's when I found uh, writing. So I started writing poetry. I used to just write, and uh, it also started. I will, since I was young, I used to watch the movies. I used to watch. I used to write them down, sort of like a composition. So poetry, I got to start doing it in high school. Mm-hmm. But uh, for spoken word poetry, I learned about it in campus. So campus was the first time I saw act- an actual poet perform, and I thought to myself, wow, this thing looks good. Mm-hmm. So that's when I wrote my first piece, and I performed it. And you performed it. Yeah. And, and how did, did, did it feel, your first performance? It felt nice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but at that time, I didn't have a purpose of uh, why I was writing. You were just writing, you know, for the sake for the sake of it. But uh, along the years, so it, it took me some time to actually write my second piece and actually perform it. But uh, once I finally got the voice, got the reason to perform, mm-hmm. it actually came out more easier, you know. Uh, but the problem with uh, us poets, or rather as artists, people, you'll see a person perform on stage, you just think it's just a performance. But in the real sense, that's what happened. That's what is happening to me. So that's what many people fail to understand. And I guess that's why most of us are still hiding in depression to mm-hmm. the name of performances. Uh-huh. Uh, but before we get further into your poetry, mm-hmm. uh, tell us about your family background. Uh, <clears throat> my family background, I was majorly raised by my grandparents. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mom was still in school. So, and my dad wasn't <coughs> in the picture, per se. Mm-hmm. So, uh, having been raised by a grandparent, so me and my mom didn't have that bond, you know, that mother and daughters should have. Mm-hmm. And uh, at some point after high school, now we started living with my mom. You know, I still felt conflicted because I felt like she, you know, we couldn't speak. I couldn't tell her what was going on with me. And half of her, she's a typical African parent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And uh, at some point, I would understand her. So I'm here out of high school, and I'm telling her, you know what, I want to pursue music. I want to pursue art. And the first thought that comes into her mind was, you know, you want to gyrate on the TV screen, <laughs> you know, all those things. So I, she was like, you know what, go to campus, get some papers. And I went to school, but not for me. I went to school for her. You know, and uh, it it took a while. Like I, I honestly wasn't feeling the schooling part because I really wanted to be in art. I really wanted to be in poetry, but she wasn't understanding. Mm-hmm. So I just uh, you know nearly familiar to simply put, just pushed on. And uh, but it got to a point whereby you know once you've done with campus, you have to find a job. Mm-hmm. That's a cycle. Yeah. So I get a job. And uh, starting up, it was okay. It was during the COVID pandemic. Uh, for us, luckily, we were not, you know, let go. And uh, but it got to a point where it became too much. Because uh, it was affecting my art, I couldn't write. I was facing a lot of writer's block. I couldn't focus. And uh, outside here, you know, even though there was the COVID pandemic, mm-hmm. somehow people were still interacting online. The art was still going on. But I wasn't being invited to these platforms. I couldn't write. I couldn't do anything. And it really affected me really bad. And at some point, I decided, you know what? I'm going to quit. I, I don't need this. But again, dealing with a typical African parent, why are you quitting? You should not quit. You know, you should work. You should work, then get money, then you leave the house. You know, such talk. So, uh, but the pressure became too much. It started affecting my health. And uh, I decided to quit. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, that's when now my mom was like, you know what, since you decided to quit, you're not welcome in my house anymore. So I had to... She basically disowned you. Yeah. (laughs) So I had to now find my bearing on my own. And uh, this one, I can say I went through a downward spiral at that point. I didn't really understand what was happening. 
And uh, but luckily for me, I have friends who really stood by me. I have two loyal, I can say loyal best friends, yeah, Njoki and uh, Joe. Mm-hmm. They stood by me. Um, at some point now, living in my parent ho- parents' house, I had to. I moved in with Njoki and her family for about a few weeks. Then I moved in with my aunt. Uh, that didn't work out, so I had to move in with my grandmother. Why didn't it work out with your aunt? The husband. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, you know, he's, he's this type of people who, like, you know, they, they don't really question, but at some point they start behaving, you know, like, you know? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I guess. Yeah, so it, there was that unspoken tension. And uh, I didn't want to bring trouble to my aunt. So the only option I had was to move in with my grandmother. And uh, through all this happening, my mom, we are not in talking terms. So it's just me. Mm -hmm. And uh, now when I moved in with my grandmother, mind you, I still haven't gotten back the vibe of writing. I still want to write. And you still have the writer's block. Yeah. And for those who do not know, writer's block is quite depressing. (laughs) Yeah, it is quite depressing. Exactly. Yes, you yeah. can't try it. And mm-hmm. You see all your, 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 your artistic friends, they're moving on and you're there. You can't no, try you're, it. you're just stuck. Yeah, you're just stuck. Yeah. And, but I knew it's because of what I was going through at that time. There was mm-hmm. so much that was in my head at that time. So I moved in with my grandmother. And that was another, <laughs> what can I say, crazy period that mm-hmm. I had with her mm-hmm. because uh, for my grandmother I used to hear stories of how she would treat people but uh, for us when we went to visit her she would change and be this sweet old you know person mm-hmm. yeah. having her grandchildren around mm-hmm. but this time around I'm there I'm living I'm living in her house actually my grandfather's house my grandfather passed on unfortunately I'm sorry yeah, and um, for my grandmother, actually. Now, the problem now came in when, uh, can I say, Matharao, Matharao Ndopandogo. So sometimes she would uh, shop in, my mom used to do shopping for her, and when she gets the things, she would just lock them in her room. And whenever I asked for anything, she'd like, ah, akuna kitu, akuna. And uh, it got to a point where she would literally, like, hide things. <laughs> even even buckets and uh, you know karai buckets and a feature too so that I cannot use mm-hmm. and uh, you know at that point I knew you know what I have to do something about my life because I cannot compete with her and uh, along the way that's when I decided you know what I need to find money and uh, before now, I can clear my mind I need to find something to get me off the troubles I'm having so that's when I started my business I used to sell chai and chapati to construction workers and through that at least I got finances to now attend you know uh, poetry shows and uh, for me I failed to mention uh, for me poetry I started attending poetry after lunch it usually happens every Thursday mm-hmm. at uh, Kenya National Theatre from 1 p.m. that's where actually I grew my art that's where I, I where I nurtured so when I finally got the finances to go back now that's when it started, you know, it started coming back to me, <laughs> the writing. And uh, the moment I decided to go back, I remember that time Pal was launching in Kakamega. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I received a call and they were like, you know what, we'd like for you to join us in Kakamega and show people what you have. And that call actually gave me the drive to start writing again. And uh, around the same period of time, that's when um, I had a friend of mine, his name is Griffins. So we call him the best. He's a very good poet. He had challenged me to start writing different because he's the one person who believed in me. So he was like, you know what? Why don't you write something, you know, catchy? Like leave all this, you know, shang and punchlines. Just do something different. <clears throat> You're good. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Hello world, this is Orina Brand coming to you with Unsung Warriors. Our guest today is called Miss Nina, but I'll let her introduce herself further. She is a youth who has undergone so many odds and is here still to tell the tale. Let's listen in. <laughs> Hi. Hi, <laughs> Hi Orina. Hi. So tell us. Who are you? Uh, 
as you said, my name is Miss Nina. Mm-hmm. I'm a poet. Actually, Miss Nina is a brand. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I'm a poet. I am an executive director of a poetic group. It's called Minefields. And uh, aside from that, I don't. What else should I say? Should I just mm, tell us everything? Everything. <laughs> tell us everything. Your age. What no, you do. No, not ask a lady no, her age. No, okay, I do no. apologize. Thank you. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> So um, uh, w- this show is called Unsung Warriors, yeah. and we get to interview people, talk to people who have undergone through a lot and still have the audacity to face life as it is. Mm-hmm. So tell us, why are you our Unsung Warrior today? Wow. You can start from the beginning. <laughs> oh, from the beginning now. Okay, my story has to do more of um, the voice in me. Mm-hmm. And uh, since I'm a poet, my poetry, number one, it's my voice. It's how I speak what is inside. And uh, it goes way back. Since uh, growing up, uh, I grew up in a family whereby I felt I didn't have a say. Uh, Whenever I would speak up, it it always brought some issues or some consequences, I would say. And so I learned how to keep things inside. And uh, to a point, uh, even not speaking... It actually led me, led me down a path of suicidal thoughts, of which I, I did try suicide twice. Uh-huh. Um, but then again, that was uh, the first time was in primary school, and uh, the second time was in high school. What was happening in primary school at that time? Okay, at that time in primary school, uh, number one, there was so much uh, bullying. I was being bullied back in primary school. Uh-huh. And uh, secondly, my grandmother is an alcoholic. And uh, in the village, so she was known for her alcoholism. So the ch- the kids will tease me, like you know, your grandmother is a queen of alcohol, and in Totoa, you know, Mlevi. Uh-huh. It was crazy, and uh, I said so that affected my self esteem really bad. Mm-hmm. I didn't believe in myself whatsoever, and uh, coming on to high school, the same problems, like not you know, not believing in myself. So, yeah, so the second time I just, okay, the first time I just took a bunch of pills around the house. Didn't work. <laughs> oh, my God, it was just a bad stomach ache. Mm-hmm. And uh, the second time, I took a container of Puritan. We used to have a shop. Okay, my grandfather used to have a shop. Uh-huh. So I took a container of Puritan and I just took them, hoping to just sleep and not wake up. So um, basically, like, not being able to speak, uh, feeling all this pain and no one is understanding me, I felt isolated. But thanks, God, thanks to God, now that's when I found uh, writing. So I started writing poetry. I used to just write, and uh, it also started. I will, since I was young, I used to watch the movies. I used to watch. I used to write them down, sort of like a composition. So poetry, I got to start doing it in high school. Mm-hmm. But uh, for spoken word poetry, I learned about it in campus. So campus was the first time I saw act- an actual poet perform, and I thought to myself, wow, this thing looks good. Mm-hmm. So that's when I wrote my first piece, and I performed it. And you performed it. Yeah. And, and how did, did, did it feel, your first performance? It felt nice. Okay. <laughs> but at that time, I didn't have a purpose of uh, what I was writing. I was just writing you know, for the sake for the sake of it. But uh, along the years, so it, it took me some time to actually write my second piece and actually perform it. But uh, once I finally got the voice, got the reason to perform, mm-hmm. it actually came out more easier, you know. Uh, but the problem with uh, us poets, or rather as artists, people, you'll see a person perform on stage, you just think it's just a performance, but in the real sense, that's what happened. That's what is happening to me. So that's what many people fail to understand. And I guess that's why most of us are still hiding in depression mm-hmm. in the name of performances. Uh-huh. Uh, but before we get further into your poetry, mm-hmm. uh, tell us about your family background. Uh, <clears throat> my family background, I was majorly raised by my grandparents. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mom was still in school. So, and my dad wasn't <coughs> in the picture, per se. Mm-hmm. So, uh, having been raised by a grandparent, so me and my mom didn't have that bond, you know, that mother and daughters should have. Mm-hmm. And uh, at some point after high school, now we started living with my mom. You know, I still felt conflicted because I felt like she, 
you know, we couldn't speak. I couldn't tell her what was going on with me. And half of her, she's a typical African parent. <laughs> and uh, at some point, I would understand her. So I'm here out of high school, and I'm telling her, you know what, I want to pursue music. I want to pursue art. And the first thought that comes into our mind was, you know, you want to gyrate on the TV screen, <laughs> you know, all those things. So I, she was like, you know what, go to campus, get some papers. And I went to school, but not for me. I went to school for her, you know. And uh, it, it took a while. Like, I, I honestly wasn't feeling the schooling part because I really wanted to be in art. I really wanted to be in poetry, but she wasn't understanding. Mm -hmm. So I just, uh, you know, nearly familiar to simply put. Just pushed on. And, uh, but it got to a point whereby, you know, once you've done with campus, you have to find a job. Mm -hmm. That's a cycle. Yeah. So I get a job. And uh, starting up, it was okay. It was during the COVID pandemic. Uh, for us, luckily, we were not, you know, let go. And uh, but it got to a point where it became too much uh, because it was affecting my art. I couldn't write. I was facing a lot of writer's block. I couldn't focus. And uh, outside here, you know, even though there was the COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. somehow people were still interacting online. The art was still going on. But I wasn't being invited to these platforms. I couldn't write. I couldn't do anything. And it really affected me really bad. And at some point, I decided, you know what? I'm going to quit. I, I don't need this. But again, dealing with a typical African parent, why are you quitting? You should not quit. You know, you should work. You should work, then get money, then you leave the house. You know, such talk. So, uh, but the pressure became too much. It started affecting my health. And uh, I decided to quit. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, that's when now my mom was like, you know what, since you've decided to quit, you're not welcome in my house anymore. So I had to... She basically disowned you. Yeah. <laughs> huh. So I had to now find my bearing on my own. And uh, this one, I can say I went through a downward spiral at that point. I didn't really understand what was happening. And uh, but luckily for me, I have friends who really stood by me. I have two loyal, I can say loyal best friends, yeah, and Jockey and uh, Joe. Mm -hmm. They stood by me. Um, at some point now, leaving my parent ho parents' house, I had to. I moved in with Jockey and her family for about a few weeks. Then I moved in with my aunt. Uh, that didn't work out, so I had to move in with my grandmother. Why didn't it work out with your aunt? The husband. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, you know, he's, he's this type of people who, like, you know, they, they don't really question, but at some point they start behaving, you know, like, you know? Uh -huh. no. I yeah, so it, there was that unspoken tension, and uh, I didn't want to bring trouble to my aunt, so the only option I had was to move in with my grandmother. And uh, through all this happening, my mom, we are not in talking terms, so it, it's just me. Mm -hmm. And uh, now when I moved in with my grandmother, mind you, I still haven't gotten back the vibe of writing. I still want to write. And you still have the writer's block. Yeah. And for those who do not know, writer's block is quite depressing. <laughs> yeah. It is quite depressing. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. You can't write and mm -hmm. you see all your, 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 your artistic friends, they're moving on and you're there. You can't no, write. You're just stuck. Yeah, you're just stuck. Yeah. And but I knew it's because of what I was going through at that time. There was yeah. so much that was in my head at that time. So I moved in with my grandmother, and that was another <laughs> what can I say crazy period that mm -hmm. I had with her. Mm -hmm. Because uh, for my grandmother, I used to hear stories of how she would treat people, but uh, for us, when we went to visit her, she would change and be this sweet old you know person yeah. having her grandchildren around mm -hmm. but this time around i'm there i'm living i'm living in her house actually my grandfather's house my grandfather passed on unfortunately i'm sorry yeah and um for my grandmother actually now the problem now came in when uh, can i say matarao matarao ndopondogo so sometimes she would uh shopping my mom used to do shopping for her and when she gets the things she just lock them in her room and whenever I asked for anything, she's like, ah, hakuna kitu, hakuna. And uh, it got to a point where she would literally, like, hide things. 
<laughs> even even buckets and uh, you know karai buckets and a feature too so that i cannot use mm-hmm. and uh, you know at that point i knew you know what i have to do something about my life because i cannot compete with her and uh, along the way that's when i decided you know what i need to find money and uh, before now, i can clear my mind i need to find something to get me off the troubles i'm having so that's when i started my business i used to sell chai and chapati to construction workers and through that at least i got finances to now attend you know uh poetry shows and uh, for me i felt to mention uh for me poetry i started attending poetry after lunch it usually happens every thursday mm-hmm. at uh, kenya national theater from 1 p.m that's where actually i grew my art that's where i where i nurtured so when i finally got the finances to go back now that's when it started you know it started coming back to me <laughs> the writing and uh, the moment i decided to go back i remember that time pal was launching in kakamega Mm-hmm. And I, I received a call and they were like, you know what, we'd like for you to join us in Kakamega and show people what you have. And that call actually gave me the drive to start writing again. And uh, around the same period of time, that's when um, I had a friend of mine, his name is Griffins. So we call him the best. He's mm-hmm. a very good poet. He had challenged me to start writing different because he is the one person who believed in me so he was like you know what why don't you write something you know catchy like leave all this you know shang and punch lines just do something different remember that's when i started writing okay before that's when i had written a piece about women the letter to my kenyan girl uh that was in the period of time where you know obado the case the murder trial with sharon the obado the governor from yeah Amigori, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. So around that time, there was a lot of femicide happening, uh-huh. and that's when I wrote, I wrote a letter to my Kenyan girl. And the reception, <laughs> the reception was like, okay, so you are not Yeah, that, that was that, and then uh, that inspired the next piece. You know, what if an African knew? Uh-huh. Uh, what if an African knew? It's a duet where basically. You know, what if an African knew? We are sort of like poking holes. We are telling people, you know, you guy, you're an African. We have all these things, but you're still poor. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. that other piece now, up until today, we usually told it's timeless. Like it's one unique piece that really gets to people. And um, still writing, you know, when it comes now to poetry, one thing that poets fail to understand, they fail to ask the question, why do you write? So for me, at first, the reason why I was writing is to have a voice, is to speak up, is to speak what is in me. Mm. But then again, as I was writing, I realized I'm not the only broken person. People are broken out here. They just don't know how to express themselves. And uh, at that point, I remember there was this uh, other poet who is also a friend of mine. His name is Kim Chokera. He had actually published a book. It's called Game On. And uh, at that point, he just approached me and told me, you know what, I'm not going to sell this book to you. I don't even want your money. I just want you to, ha- to have it. So he gave it to me for free. And mm-hmm. then the one question he was asking me, why do you write? The moment you realize why you write, it has to be a reason why, you know, a reason you'll be willing to die for. Wow. And uh, after I read his book, that's when I totally, I kind of understood myself. Uh-huh. Because for me, for the pieces that I perform, it's usually to ask the question, to start a conversation. But then again, why do I write? So it's in search of justice. So for me, that's when I, I, read, I wrote the piece called Kijana. Kijana actually, it gets to the guys a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're like, hey, man, I'm not a boy child. <laughs> Would you give us a snippet of, <laughs> of that poem? Uh, okay. Uh-huh. Um, Kijana. Kijana, you have no right to ask me any question. Because that would only give me a reason to put a bullet in you. Kijana, stay kujo metoka wapi, sinajua ni masaya kafu. Tayari we ni muizu na ibi ya serikali wakati. Kijana, usijaribu kunitisha ID, kuna jaribu kunifunza kazi, fala kijana. You have no right to remain silent because nothing you'll say will keep them from being violent. So kijana, skiza. See, this ain't the time to learn your ABCs or how to flirt with chicks. It's time to let your ego learn your view to a ground different. Don't you see? Don't you see that your daily struggles have been turned into somebody's ammunition, Kijana? You're removing target simply because you're a man. Yes. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, and uh, aside from that, okay, uh, I've been called a feminist, <laughs> an activist. <laughs> Uh-huh. And uh huh. Do you feel that you won those titles? Um, you know, I, I, I'm not really a feminist. <laughs> <laughs> I just speak up facts. Mm-hmm. I speak up something that is happening at that time. Mm-hmm. Like for example, for Kijana, it's it's the issues that is that are happening. Like young men are just being arrested for no good reason. So you know, Kijana, and uh, actually, it's a story about myself. <laughs> you actually arrested. <laughs> Yeah. On our way home, like we we just come from a show and we are heading home. It was on a Sunday afternoon, and you know these police, you know, ununiformed guys they just came out from nowhere, mm. and they handcuffed my friend, the the guys that I was with. And I was like, okay, okay, goja, ni nendele apa? You know, they don't like being questioned, and uh, there was an argument that ensued, and uh, yeah, I almost got slapped really hard. <laughs> But anyways, uh, we got over that. So um, aside from Kijana, I've also written other pieces. Man, you know, man is also a dedication to the guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've also written Kalami a Woman. Now, Kalami a Woman came in due to the current situation we're having as ladies. There's this topic of colorism that people haven't, aren't really speaking up about. And people are ignorant or rather... They just they are they in denial that it's happening. Mm-hmm. So Kalamia woman is just basically asking, you know, what do you want from us? <laughs> you know, like there's this uh, shape you want from a woman, but in reality there's us who are not. We don't have a light skin. We we have we are flat chested. We don't have you know the calves <laughs> in mm-hmm. the right places. Mm-hmm. So what do you want? So Kalamia woman then, so I can be able to explain to my daughter why she has to work ten times harder for the world to accept her. Again, would you have a snippet for that? <laughs> I'm sorry I'm putting you on the spot, but you seem that your topics are quite intriguing. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, um, <clears throat> color me a woman. She wants to fit in, but all they see is the color of her skin. Make it brighter. She needs to be visible. Forget the dark tone. It's not trophy enough. Mm-hmm. And drop the tummy fat. You need to be completely flat. And widen those hips and plump her ass. Lengthen her hair and make it Brazilian. Sharpen her nose and break her jaw. Sharpen those nails and give her claws. And minimize her clothes and shake her assets. She needs to be ratchet. I mean, isn't that what the world wants? No applause for the girl next door. The one with the dark skin that mimics the earth. The one who is thin but not <laughs> model enough. The one who loves sneakers and the warmth from onesies. The one with the belly fat and the flat ass. The one without the... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> I believe we're supposed to do this. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, tell me then. Would you say that your poetry... Um, has gotten you out of drastic situations like for example you say that you have you did try to commit suicide twice Mm -hmm. and also for instance you living with your grandmother who is an alcoholic and sort of such stuff Mm -hmm. would you say that poetry has helped you survive such occasions yeah it has and uh, I usually tell people, for me, I, I really, I, I don't like speaking as such about what I'm going through. Because mm-hmm. I, I feel as if when I tell my problems, it's like a burden to someone else. So I usually tell people, read my poems. You want to know me, read my poems. Read your poems. Yeah. Uh-huh. But people, there's some people who still don't understand. But there are some others, like, when I post something on, um, you know, on on my WhatsApp, mostly, I usually start with my WhatsApp status. They are quick. They, they are quick to come to my <laughs> DM, and they are like, "Are you okay? W- w- what's happening?" Mm. Like some people who understand. Mm. Like I remember, there's there's a piece I wrote. Don't tell me to speak. Don't tell me to speak is about uh, depression. Uh, it's about uh, you know people usually tell people they ask you know after a person commits suicide that's when they start asking mbona akuongea mbona akuanatuambia but in the real sense a depressed person usually speaks you're just not listening because a depressed person like personally for me I'll smile with you but I'm not okay I'll tell you I'm okay but I'm not I mean sometimes I would decide you know what I won't lose the shin and I won't have the phone with me. I just go silent. You are thinking, oh no, Nina is just relaxing. No, but there's something happening in my mind. I mean, I have friends who drown themselves in alcohol. You, you're seeing a party freak. 
him he's dying inside mm. so depressed people they speak you just don't listen that's a problem so when i wrote uh, don't tell me to speak some people actually got <laughs> you know what i was trying to say and they reached out and they're like no niambia what's going on and all that but most people are like hey another case <laughs> yeah okay mm-hmm. uh, i was so uh, are you the first born to my mom yes <laughs> to your mom yes. yeah <laughs> of how many uh to my mom you too to yes, my dad we nine <laughs> and uh okay now, now to your mom side and mm-hmm. i believe that that one the next the one you've grown up with yeah um how how was it to take care of your sibling mm-hmm. with all that is going your your grandmother now you are very disowned you go mm-hmm. to your grandmother your grandmother now you get to take care of her when she gets alcohol uh, mm-hmm. i presume yeah she gets into alcohol yeah. how was it for your sibling uh for my sister actually when i moved in with my grandmother mm-hmm. she moved back with my mom because that's when she had finished her class eight mm-hmm. so she she was with my mom at that time mm-hmm. uh and before when i was with my mom she was with my grandmother because at some point uh, she got uh, sick she had surgery done to her so she needed at home care like 24/7 mm-hmm. and since my mom and i we were busy so my grandmother took up the responsibility and she started going to school just nearby mm-hmm. so once she was done so you see at some point it was just me and my mom uh, with my grandmother then now when roles changed mm-hmm. now she moved with, with my mom and I, with, I was with my grandmother mm-hmm. and uh, it got to a point where i just started hating myself when i was there I started hating myself. I started hating my mom. I hated my sister. I actually it, it felt like she was just slowly dying inside. Like uh, hiding in isolation and all that. And then I remember at some point um you know the construction business it's a limited what can I say limited contract <laughs> because it got to a point where there there are no jobs, mm-hmm. no construction sites, nothing. So you're back to round one. Don't have any finances grandmother is an alcoholic she's bringing her friends in the house they do whatever so my sanctuary was my room so i used to lock myself up in the room and uh, i used to you know for my window i just put a blanket over it so that no light would come through and i don't know sometimes i wouldn't even check the time i'm waking up or sleeping because i would just wake up and just sit in there yeah depression is real <laughs> so I'll just sit in the dark and sometimes i'll just go to sleep hungry like i didn't even the time was just passing by it wasn't I, i wasn't actually how can i say this it's like my reality i wasn't there i just didn't want to live anymore but then again i realized no i still have to write because in my poetry one thing that has happened is that uh, during the covid period uh you know online people moved online mm-hmm. so i used to post my pieces on different international pages and i used to have people who actually liked my pieces and they reached out to me and uh, actually i do have some people mentoring right now <laughs> yeah so i have one guy his name is Dolapo from Nigeria then i have another from his name I have a lady from Brazil mm-hmm. so they reach out so actually when they reach out i look at my phone and i'm like no i can't just be sitting in the darkness no I have to help these people. Actually, they're the ones who motivated me to like rise up and mm-hmm. go back. Mm-hmm. And uh that's when I decided, you know what? I'm going back home. I don't care what my mom is saying about me. <laughs> I don't care whether she doesn't want to see me, but I'm going back home. Mm-hmm. So I went back. And my mom is uh she doesn't like confronting situations. She doesn't like to speak. So I did what I do best. I wrote a five-page letter. I wrote it. And I placed it on her bed and I left for that day because <laughs> I didn't want to be there <laughs> when she was reading. I remember I left, I went to my friend in Jockey's place and I stayed there for a few days until, you know, I feel like she's read. <laughs> Then I came back. And uh, believe in me, from that point, things have changed with my mom. We were not as close before, but no, after that, it's better. things are better. And with your grandmother? not good <laughs> not good all well, this time right uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i don't know <laughs> uh, uh, tell us now mm-hmm. uh, clearly your po- your poetry has spoken to so many yeah in fact internationally as you have said brazil 
Nigeria, Nigeria. And Tanzania. Yes. <laughs> but you say that, that you believe that some of your pieces have actually spoken to some of the youths out there and they and it has encouraged them to come out and speak of their mobile depression instead of holding it and bulking it. Yeah, well I say it has there are people who usually approach me and they're like, hey, your piece it really hit a nerve. Mm -hmm. You really spoke about something. But I can say right now people are still afraid of we still that unspoken fear to speak up. Uh, mostly like right now there's some pieces that I've written that have even my family, they are, they are afraid, like my uncles. <laughs> mm. They're like, are you becoming a revolutionary or something? <laughs> okay, like, uh, for example, the last piece I've done, it's Remember Their Names. So Remember Their Names, it's in memory of uh, the people who died in the name of curfew, mm. those people. So most of the times, we don't even remember their names. We just, you know, when a person dies, we go out on the street, we cry, then things go by, like, you know, with the Kejokoma uh, brothers. Like, People just went, we, ha right now it's silent, no one is speaking, yeah. and people don't even remember their names. So some pieces like that, it really, some, some people are just worried, they're like, okay, why did you do that? You know, <laughs> you're, you're pushing a boundary, that, that's, that's, that's not okay. Uh, but aside from that, some other pieces, like the one I mentioned, man, mm -hmm. man, you know, dedication to the guys, hey, they would approach me, they're like, hey, bana. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll do my best, yeah. <laughs> uh, what would you tell about the youths out there who are undergoing depression and cannot find the voice yet? What would you tell them? Okay, first, before they get to the youth, mm -hmm. we have to start from where they came from, that is the parents. The parents. The parents need to understand that, you know, we are changing, we're in a changing generation right now. I hear we're being called millennials right now. Mm -hmm. The way they were raised should not be the way they should raise us right now. Because you find that uh, most parents right now, because uh, a parent will tell you, ah, mini li chapa ni kama dogo so lazima ni you know. As in, parents get to understand your kids. Don't force them into a cycle. Mm -hmm. that is not fitting for them. Mm -hmm. Like, for me, I wanted to pursue art. Right now, I, by the, right now I'm feeling, like, at ease because <laughs> I'm finally getting my time to pursue art, to be in the theater and all that. Mm -hmm. But what did it take for me to convince my parent to let me be? I had to, she had to, like, cut me off for some time. I had to go through all this craziness just to tell her. And I know someone, there's someone else who has gone through worse than I have. But all that would have happened if the parent would sit down and ask me, okay, what do you want? You know, have that conversation. Don't force your kids into a cycle that they're not ready for or they're not part of. And when it comes down to the youth, youth should really understand why they're doing something. Something that really aches me the most right now. Mm -hmm. You get a person saying that they're into art, they're into music, and then you listen to the content that they have, and you're thinking, okay... Can you just stop singing about money you don't have or singing about girls' asses and boobs? <laughs> like, no. Figure yourself out. Have a voice. Discover wh what is it you write. Why is it that you're writing? And when it comes down now to depression, check up on your people. Just check up on someone. Say, hi, how are you doing? You know, I'm just checking up on you. Don't just be self-centered. And as I say, the depressed people, they speak. You just have to listen. Don't listen with your ears. Listen with your eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where can we find your poetry? I can find it on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Mostly post on Instagram and Facebook as well. Instagram is Miss Nina. That is M S dot Nina two five four. Uh, -huh. uh same, same as to Facebook, Miss Nina two five four. And uh, I also have uh, an account at Poemia. Poemia is a poetry account, by the way. People should actually visit that place. It's an app. Just download it on your phone. Poemia. P O E M I A. Yeah, Miss Nina, you'll find my art there as well. Miss Nina. Mm -hmm. Any part in short for us? Uh, be you. Be you. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for your inspiration. You are truly an unsung warrior, and we do hope that you do not stop what you're doing mm -hmm. for us, the youth out there. Thank you. We appreciate you. I appreciate as well. <laughs> this is Miss Nina right here, coming to you with unsung warrior. We tend to forget that youth are actually the future. They are the foundation of the future and the many generations that are, to, that are to come in the next years. Please, let us listen in. Let us speak to one another.
let us listen and encourage one another and if you have a voice out there use it because someone out there might need to hear it this is arena brand coming to you with unsung warrior life is precious seize every moment of it <laughs>